Okay, so I think we can start. Good afternoon. So um, today we will start discussing spin, and in particular I will discuss a very important experiment, which is called the Stern Gerlach apparatus and experiment. Doesn't like it. <laughs> OK, so uh, the experiment dates back to the early days of quantum mechanics. Um, and it was uh, essentially done in this way. There is a, a, a source of um, atoms, um, a furnace, uh, where you essentially evaporate silver atoms, okay? So a piece of silver, you evaporate them, and they come out with a certain, they are at a certain temperature, so they come out with a certain speed. And you just make a hole in a screen in such a way that you make a collimated beam, okay? So here is a, a beam of uh, silver atoms, okay? Then these atoms, um, arrive into the true apparatus, which is, well, let me draw it like this. It is essentially a magnet with a north and south pole. Um, the, uh, if I take a, a, a front view, okay, the section of this thing is like this. So the, it's not just play, plain things, but the North Pole has a protruding uh, corner. Uh, the South is smoother, like that. Mm. So there is some magnetic field. In fact, it is an homo inhomogeneous magnetic field. Uh, the field is, um, for instance, stronger here than here because of this uh, corner. Mm. OK. In any case, here's the field, so going, roughly speaking, into this direction, which we will call, for instance, uh, Z. Mm? Uh, the beam is going in, say, in the direction uh, Y. Mm? Uh, and then there is a screen. Okay? And what Stern and Gerlach notice is that when you put the apparatus on, so that you put this magnet, the, what you get is that there are two spots on the screen, okay? Spot one and spot two, and there is an equal abundance of atoms then that end into those two spots. Hmm? So roughly speaking, half of the atoms go there and half go there. In this uh, twofold nature of uh, the the, the, this uh, um, appearance on the screen was totally uh, ununderstandable in terms of classical physics. So let us uh, return a little bit to classical physics to try to see what you expect in classical physics. Now, uh, in order for a magnetic field to influence a, a piece of classical um, system, you need, since there is no uh, magnetic monopole, uh, you need to have uh, some dipole, okay? So, and then you know that if you have a magnetic dipole, mm, the potential energy will be minus the dipole times the magnetic field that there is a, at a certain posi position, okay? And this is exactly the energy that tends to align the dipole to the field, okay? This is known, right, from classical physics, OK? Magnetic dipoles tend to align to the field, OK? Now, you realize that this, the fact that there is a potential energy of this type depending on the position implies that there is a force. Mm? The J component of the force acting at a certain position R is equal to minus the, the, uh, the, the, the derivative with respect to Rj of this function u of r, right? Mm. So 
So if you calculate, you get mu dot b derivative with respect to rj. Okay? Notice the scalar product uh, is with all components of b, but you are taking the derivative of all components with respect to rj. Mm -hmm. Is this clear? I mean, this means explicitly some overall components of this thing. Uh, mu alpha, the derivative of B alpha with respect to RJ. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So you realize why they don't just put a uniform field. If you put a uniform field, you do not expect much because the derivative of the field is zero, so you expect no force. Hmm? Nothing will really deflect in a uniform field. That's the reason why they put a field that is inhomogeneous. So it's stronger here than here. So if I call this uh, direction z, mm, the field, so this is z, and this is bz, how strong is the field? It is stronger close to the north pole, and it's weaker there. So there is a derivative of bz with respect to z the third direction, okay, which is different, definitely different from zero. It is, in fact, negative in this picture. Mm. Okay, so in this way, you expect a force. Mm. But you expect the force, and in general, this force then will be multiplied by mu, the magnetic moment. Uh, therefore, the force will be depending on the uh, magnetic moment of the silver atom. Mm. And if you imagine that the silver atoms supposedly have a magnetic moment, it's not clear why. And in fact, we'll discuss what could be the source of this magnetic moment. But suppose that the silver atoms have, for some reason, a magnetic moment, then classically you would think that this magnetic moment is really mm, comes in a random way when the silver atom comes out of the furnace. And depending on the projection being a little bit positive or negative, okay? This force will be positive, negative, weaker, stronger, whatever, okay? You expect, in other words, that here you would have some blob, okay, of atoms deflected in greater or smaller way, depending on what their magnetic moment will be, okay? A, in a kind of smooth um, appearance, all right? On the contrary, it looks like nothing here is present except two very, very sharp spots. So it's like if mu, in some sense, is first of all not really arbitrary, it's quite well defined, and it's only two possible values. Okay? So this is the striking feature hmm? two possible values of the magnetic moment. Uh, then if you start thinking about uh, silver, you also realize that even thinking uh, into a Schrodinger-like uh, type of fashion, so um, thinking of uh, orbitals of electrons, um, you realize that silver, okay, silver has, by the way, um, essentially the same structure of krypton, which is the a uh, noble gas with all filled shells, plus um, it has 4D electrons, but again full, so 10 electrons in the 4D shell, and one 5S electron. I'm talking here as I would if I was discussing you know, elementary chemistry with you, okay? So you should imagine all the boxes of the different electronic levels of, say, a nitrogen-like a atom filled according to Pauli principle. So this is really many electron scheme. Okay, we will discuss this a little bit towards the end, the many electron scheme, Pauli principle, and so on and so forth. But I assumed kind of previous knowledge of this. Okay, yeah. Um, X, Y, and Z, the three components. What? To Rj, the, 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 for instance, 
this would be component X, component, suppose, the force along Z. Okay, the force along Z, for instance, is given by this. Differentiating the magnetic field with respect to the Z uh, position. Yeah, there is a dot program. So there is the three components. So this would be explicitly mu x times the derivative of bx with respect to rz plus mu y, the derivative of by with rz plus uh, mu z, the derivative of bz with respect to rz. Okay? And practically, well, uh, if you look at this geometry uh, being the, the essentially the beam in this region here, um, essentially by symmetry, this is the most important piece. Okay? So it really depends on what mu z comes uh, uh, in the beam, okay? And this will multiply this gradient of, uh, you see, it's the same quantity I'm plotting here. I'm just calling z what I was calling the uh, rz, position of the beam, okay? So depending on, on, the, on, the, on the gradient, I will have a certain force which is proportional to the mu z, to the, to the projection along z of the magnetic moment. So if the mu z comes to be zero, there no force, and you go straight. If mu z comes positive, you will feel a negative force because b z in b is negative, okay? So you will go down. If you be, uh, mu z comes uh, down, then you will feel a positive force. You will go up, okay? But since this is a continuous object, uh, in, you can expect classically, if there is a magnetic moment, it will be just anywhere, hmm? you expect a blob. On the contrary, it looks like mu z can have only two possible values, according to the experiment. And this was something really puzzling, because again, if you even think quantum mechanically, uh, you think of orbitals, and you realize that silver really has a single S electron, which is unpaired. Everything else is full shells of, uh, of electrons. So really, rather than thinking of a silver atom beam, think of hydrogen atom beams. The, mentally, it would be the same thing. The difficulty is that Hydrogen tends to form molecules, okay? So it's much harder to form uh, a beam of single atoms, single hydrogen atoms, rather than evaporating some uh, uh, silver um, metal in a crucible, okay? You, you just get atoms of silver, not molecules, and, and this is a simple enough experiment. So with hydrogen, you will get, for instance, hydrogen molecules, and before you just make atoms, you would need to, okay, to, I mean, m much more complicated. Okay, but mentally, uh, if you prefer, you can think of hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen has, for instance, in the ground state, atoms in the 1s, hmm? and there is really no possible source of magnetic moment. Why? Well, classically, you know that a magnetic moment is associated, for instance, to a charge, some charge that rotates, okay? And in fact, you can calculate that in, a, in, an, in electromagnetism um, that the magnetic moment hmm, associated to a charge that rotates, let's call it mu, is just equal to the charge as, uh, for the electron is minus E, okay? Will be minus E over 2mc times the orbital angular momentum, okay? The magnetic moment is associated to a, a current of charge, so to some velocity uh, um, vector product with a certain position, okay? If you go and back and look at your expressions for the magnetic moment, you will see that it's exactly the same expression appearing in the angular momentum, hmm? apart from charges and mass that are not there in, and an extra C, depending on the units, by the way, okay? So, uh, a charge that rotates has an angular momentum and has a magnetic moment. In classical physics, 
and in quantum physics would be roughly the same. Okay? So here, by the way, let me put here the h bar. I know that h bar is unit of angular momentum in, okay? And in this way, this is angular momentum dimensionless, okay? So in this way, all the units are in front, okay? So you notice that this object here is a quantity which is made all of universal constant, but has the uh, dimensions of a magnetic moment. And indeed, it is called the Bohr magneton, okay? It is called mu b, Bohr magneton. So this is a kind of quantum, a unit of magnetic moment. So you realize that um, if you have an angular momentum, you expect to have magnetic moments of the order of a certain multiple of uh, Bohr magnetons. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in an L state, like here, you have L equals zero, okay? So certainly no magnetic moment. So it's a false impression uh, to think of 1s electrons as orbiting. They really do not orbit in some sense. They stay, eh? have zero angular momentum. Mm? So it's totally unclear of where this mu might come from. Mu is zero for a 1s electron of hydrogen. So you expect no deviation at all. But even if, suppose, there is a certain fraction of atoms that are excited in a p state, for instance, in the two p states, hmm, then you would say, okay, maybe I might have a magnetic moment because two p electrons have L equal one, okay? But then I would expect that um, everything is related to uh, mu z, which is minus the Bohr magneton Lz. But I know that Lz, quantum mechanically, can have three possible values if L is equal to 1, plus 1, 0, and minus 1. So you would expect that if the atom exits in a state of, uh, say, plus 1, eh, it will get deviated in a certain spot. If it exits in 0, it will just go straight in the middle. Mm -hmm. And if it exits in minus 1, it will be deviated in the opposite. Okay? Three spots, in other words, are expected. Mm -hmm. And for any L, you expect two L plus 1 spots. Therefore, an, in, a, 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 an odd integer number of spots. Never two, which is what is found in the experiment. So even if you argue beyond classical physics in a quantum mechanical kind of frame of mind, you would never expect two spots. So there is something missing in our description of even a quantum system like hydrogen or whatever. And this, uh, now, all I have uh, done makes a heavy, um, I mean, relies on classical physics in a certain number of points, but it can be a little bit further justified by a quantum mechanical calculation um, by separating somehow the internal part of the motion from the motion of the center of mass, okay? Last time we separated the center of mass that was going just free. Mm? Now, if there is a, a, a magnetic field like this, the center of mass will not be just free. But you can still separate um, quite effectively uh, by the so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation, the motion of the center of mass and the motion of the internal um, relative motion, okay? And the result is quite the same, in fact. So the, the state of the electron orbiting determines if the system just uh, goes up, goes in the middle, moves down, okay? So it's, this is kind of device that measures the electronic state of the system, in some sense, by essentially the value of mu z, okay? So this can be done better than just a purely classical way. So before adventuring, in fact, in introducing spin, let me argue with you where a term like this uh, or uh, in better forms, you see, 
you expect this to be, if I substitute that expression, to be just mu b l dot b, OK? Where this comes, uh, for instance, in a classical, in a, in a quantum mechanical type of calculation. The question is, uh, this means that this theory is not describing hydrogen atom. Uh, it's partly right and partly wrong. Uh, it is true. This theory does not fully describe hydrogen, hydrogen atom because we miss one fundamental ingredient, which is the spin, which is not introduced so far, which enters the Hamiltonian as soon as you have a magnetic field. Okay? So, and, and it is there even if there is no magnetic field. Okay? The spin is always there. It appears explicitly in the Hamiltonian when you turn on a magnetic field. This is part of the answer. The other part of the answer is the picture you have mentally is wrong. I stress again, you shouldn't think of 1s atoms as electrons orbiting. Otherwise, they would have an angular momentum. They have angular momentum zero. Okay? So cautious with your classical picture of planets orbiting. Hmm? In some sense, this is misleading. Okay? S states have zero angular momentum. Hmm. Around, but not orbiting. It's everywhere is staying. You, huh? It's a cloud. Okay? You can, if you measure, you can find it anywhere around in a perfectly symmetric way when you are in the nest state. You measure the electron there. It's the same as measuring there, there, there. Okay? But it's not moving in this way in some sense. It is all right? very hard to describe in a classical way because it's deeply quantum mechanics. Yeah. Again? Uh, that is a, 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 the question is why we don't see the spin before we apply the magnetic field, okay? Um, well, in some sense, this is partly not true. Strictly speaking, I have just neglected small relativistic corrections to the Hamiltonian in which the spin would appear already, okay? We will see this later on we will see that in the Hamiltonian there are terms of relativistic origin that look like this, even in absence of magnetic field. They are called spin orbit coupling, okay? Now, you might ask, where do they come from, okay? They come from relativity. So in principle, to deduce them, I should start from a fully relativistic theory, like Dirac theory, okay? And then I would need to take a non-relativistic approximation of that, and I would obtain, mm, as most important term, the usual p square, uh, the Coulomb potential, and also smaller terms like this. So the spin would already appear at that level. If I turn on a field, it appears more explicitly. Okay? But this is another chapter. We will do it later on. For the time being, I'm kind of omitting those terms. Okay? So the spin has not appeared because I have not really looked carefully enough. Hmm? Okay, so is this uh, clear until now? I want to just to give you a, 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 a fast type of uh, derivation to show you that even quantum mechanically, you get something like this. Hmm? If you forget about spin, obviously. So you get a term that is proportional to L dot B, and therefore, you would not expect two spots, but rather three or an five or, an, or one, OK? So let, them, let me just explain this. Um, so I, I think I can erase this. Hmm. 
So if I were to write the Hamiltonian of an hydrogen atom until now, what would you write for the internal part of the? You would say this is 1 over twice the mass. It's really reduced mass. But now, not to make confusion with this, let me call it m. Then there is p. Normally, it's p squared uh, minus uh, e squared over r. This would be Coulomb potential. Now, in the presence of a magnetic field, so now I have my nucleus, and there is an electron, and there is some magnetic field, OK? Now, in the presence of the magnetic field, I I know that I, from, from classical physics, I expect that the vector potential will enter into the classical Hamiltonian. And the prescription to obtain the quantum Hamiltonian is, as usual, take the same classical Hamiltonian, but just interpret this object now close to the momentum, which is minus i h bar the gradient, as some operator. OK? So this would be the quantum Hamiltonian that I would need to write. Mm? Now, suppose that the magnetic field was, uh, to simplify things, just uniform in the z direction. OK? Uh, now, the magnetic field is not uniform, as we have said, but to the scale of the, of the uh, electronic motion, I can think of this as being uniform, okay, except that this uniform value slowly changes as I move the atom, okay? So in some sense, I'm doing kind of approximation here. I'm supposing that the magnetic field varies gently on the scale of the angstrom, which is the important thing that uh, occurs obviously at the atomic length. Hmm? Okay, so suppose that BZ was uniform. Then I would describe A. How do I write a, a vector potential that describes a uniform field in the z direction? You know that the solution is, can be written in many ways. But one possible way is this. OK? So I have to take a, a, a vector potential such that the curl of A is equal to BZ in the z direction. And you see immediately that this object here, written in this way, is exactly a curl that is, so b equal to curl of a, you can verify, is just equal to bz times z. Hmm? Very simple thing. OK? There are other choices, obviously, but this is the most symmetric one. And in particular, you notice that this field here has a divergence which is equal to 0, which is also quite a useful thing. OK. Now, with this, I'm ready to write the Hamiltonian now. And this is p square. OK. Then I have a term that is the square of a. And then I have two terms. I have to be careful here, because when I square operators, so there is E over C. I have P dot A plus A dot P. Is this clear? OK. And then I have the usual minus C squared over R. OK. So this would be the Hamiltonian without magnetic field that we have discussed so far. But now there are these terms. Now, this term is actually not so important. We can calculate. Um, it is 1 over twice the mass, e square over c square. And then I have the square of this. So I have bz square over 4. And then I have x squared plus y squared. So you see, it's kind of a confining potential. You see, it's in a co kind of com par parabolic potential in the xy plane, OK, uh, with a certain strength, which is related to the magnetic field square. 
And you see, due to the C there, you can uh, quite easily mm, test that this is pretty small, OK? So uh, you can estimate it to be uh, of the order of uh, mu b, b z square divided by the Rydberg, OK? So if you approximate this to be just the Bohr magneton square, mm, you can reconstruct that this object here is an energy which is proportional to mu b times the magnetic field square divided by the Rydberg. The reason why there is a magnetic field square is obvious. Huh? You can also uh, uh, um, see that there is, a magnet, uh, there is a Bohr magneton square. Why? Because you see there is E square over C square, okay? And if you reconstruct all the all the, all the important thing coming also from uh, the Bohr magneton square that somehow is governing this, uh, the strength of this term, you really um, recognize this object. Now, you must be uh, ready to uh, imagine the order of magnitude of this thing, mu b b, okay? The magnetic field times the Bohr magneton is a small energy, okay? If the field is one tesla, just to give you the idea, for a field of one tesla, mu bb, guess how much it is? It is roughly 5.8 milli electron volt, okay? So for our um, mind of uh, atomic physics, this is a very, very small energy. The field is very large, one tesla. It's a very generous la laboratory field, okay? Not the largest field you can make in a lab, but it's a pretty generous field. Hmm? Much, much larger than the field uh, due to the earth and so, so forth, OK? It's a very, very strong field. Still, the energy, hmm, which we will see, will be the typical energy that the electronic states split in the presence of the field, so keep this in mind, is very, very small. Compared to what? Compared to the Rydberg to the separation between the energy level of hydrogen, which is of the order of 13.6 electron volts, okay? We're talking of several orders of magnitude difference. So this is not particularly strong, and is not particularly important if this is there, because this is linear in A, so linear in BZ, and this is square, okay? So if the linear term is present, the square is not so important. If this is not present, then you should invoke the thing. This is a, well, ne never mind. I close here, okay? When is this variable? I mean, what's the signature behind this concept? Which one? This? Yeah. Okay, this is at the origin of uh, uh, diamagnetism, okay? So whenever the system has no actual magnetic moment, this brings an increase of energy in the presence of the field, so a diamagnetic type of term, okay? While this, you, you see pretty uh, simply, uh, brings to a linear decrease of energy in the presence of the field. Why linear? Because you just align yourself opposite to the field, okay? So in some sense, while this is related to the fact that the energy increases quadratically with the field, this is related to the fact that the energy of the ground state just decreases linearly. This is paramagnetic type of response. This is diamagnetic. So uh, if you think of it magnetically, it's a very d different type of thing. But there are systems that are diamagnetic. In some sense, in, that, in those systems, it's like if this is not present. In any case, let me close this digression because I want to go and analyze this term, which is certainly linear and therefore, in principle, for small fields, more important than this. Now, let's see. What is the meaning of p dot a? a dot p is pretty simple. a is some function, some vector function there, okay? p is the gradient, okay? It acts to the right on wave functions, no problem. But p dot a is p, which is a gradient, acting on A and on a wave function, okay? So this term has to be interpreted as acting on some wave function, and it acts, uh, therefore, in two possible ways. You can take 
derivatives of this or derivatives of that. Okay? So whenever you have p before a, should be careful. This is really two terms. One is minus i h bar, the gradient applied to a mm, and psi untouched. And the other is simply a dot the gradient applied to psi. OK? But now you see that this is the divergence of a, okay, which is 0 for our choice. So whenever you have a divergence of a, 0, don't worry about this. And this is nothing but a copy of this. Okay? So for those divergence of a equal to 0 cases, here you have effectively a factor 2. Hmm? Like you would have if you were doing essentially a classical calculation, right? So one they it's like if they commute, OK? All right. Clear? So when the divergence of A is 0, P and A commute. And you just write 2. Now, let's proceed. Now, I still write this. And so let me single out this 1 over 2M from here. Then I have 2e over c from here. Then I have a. a is what? a is b, the magnetic field. There is a factor 2 again. And then I have three components. And I have to take the scalar product. So it's uh, minus y multiplying px plus x multiplying py plus 0, because the third component is 0. And now you see what is this? x p y minus y p x. What is it? L z. So you see, you have b z l z times what? E over m c. Put an h bar here and divide by h bar here. OK? So in other words, this object is now l z divided by h bar. What is this? Mu b. Uh, sorry, the 2, let me leave it there. I erase this 2 with this 2, OK? So this is mu b. OK? Very good. So we reconstructed that this term is really mu b lz times bz, OK? So it's just this object, well, specialized to the case of a uniform field, OK? pretty much as you would expect in classical terms. So the, in some sense, the origin of this a dot p term is the same as the origin of, I mean, is this. So it's magnetic field coupled to the orbital uh, magnetic moment, or if you want, to the, orbi uh, to the orbital angular momentum. All right? So. By doing a more sophisticated theory, letting B to vary with space and doing Born-Oppenheimer, you can essentially put an, uh, on a firm ground what we have discussed in classical terms, which is to repeat that you would never expect just two spots. OK? You expect an odd number of spots. Quantum mechanically, classically, just a, a blob. All right. At this point, I have to take a jump, OK? So if I, were, if I was doing a relativistic quantum theory, then I would go through the Dirac theory, and I would take an appropriate non-relativistic limit and see that the Hamiltonian really is not this, but there are other pieces. Since I'm, I, I won't do that detour, I just tell you, OK? So I just tell you that the Hamiltonian for a particle in a magnetic field is not simply this, but there is another term that looks a little bit like this, but with a new operator that is called S. Okay? It's an angular momentum. Okay? So same properties of commutation as L, 
but quite different in, in, in spirit, and in particular is not related to orbital part of the wave function. Uh, by the way, this uh, number here uh, is really two from the Dirac theory, but if you calculate corrections to it in quantum electrodynamics, it's slightly different from two. Never mind, take it two. So there is slight difference between these two in this factor, okay? And then the fact that the spin there is a new, is a new quantity. So um, here, strictly speaking, still from the Dirac theory, I would obtain other objects, okay? Other uh, relativistic corrections. We will discuss we will discuss them uh, later on mm -hmm. because at least one piece of this relativistic correction is pretty much important. It's the spin orbit coupling, okay? So it's a term of type lambda L dot S. Mm -hmm. So more about this later on. For the time being, let us concentrate a little bit more on this, okay? So in fact, let me put two. Let us discuss a little bit this. Okay. So first of all, the spin is really a new, new physics for our um, story, and it doesn't live in the same Hilbert space as we have uh, worked so far. So it doesn't act on wave functions of the standard type. There is no meaning in uh, uh, acting with a spin on psi of x, okay? In some sense, this psi of x was coming from certain wave functions, okay, which or let me call them phi of n, which were a basis of uh, some orbital Hilbert space, okay? Until now, we have worked only with kind of quantities related to the motion of particles around, so, okay, so the orbital, to distinguish it from now what I'm going to introduce, I will put orb there. Hmm? Now there is a, a, new, a, new, a new Hilbert space. This Hilbert space is very, very simple. For a single particle, rather than being an infinite dimensional Hilbert space of L2 functions, pretty much complicated, it's a very innocent looking object. It's only two functions. One I will call plus one half, and another I will call minus one half. But to remind me of plus and minus with respect to what direction of quantization, I put z there, okay? So there are two states. These are spin states. You see, it's essentially here to have a notation that is more abstract than just wave functions. After all, this was what? Overlap of x and a state psi. Now, the state lives in another space, and there is no meaning in, in doing this, okay? There is absolutely no meaning in taking the scalar product of a spin state with an x eigenstate, all right? So I, I, I never write this, all right? Now, this piece of Hilbert space is called the spin Hilbert space, okay? And this two-dimensional, you see two states in the basis, okay? Two-dimensional. Now, how do I uh, form an arbitrary state of my system? Supposing that the system lives in this Hilbert space and also in this. Hmm? Uh, mathematicians uh, define what is called the product, the tensor product of the Hilbert space in practical terms, means simply this. If this is a basis of the orbital Hilbert uh, space, then a basis for the combined system will be just made by this and that, or this and that, okay? In other words, the most arbitrary state should be made as follows. Sum over n of an orbital part times the spin part with spin plus one half, 
I will talk more about these two guys. For the time being, think of two states in this two-dimensional hyperspace. I will talk to you about this in a second. Okay? So this is one possible basis element. Then there is another possible basis element. This is this. Okay? And generally speaking, all, every, every state can be um, occupied with a certain, uh, oh, sorry, occupied. It can be summed together with a certain uh, elements, which I could call C uh, plus, for instance, in this case, okay? Uh, Cn plus, and here I have Cn minus, okay? So this means taking the tensor product. It means that you have to assume that there is not only phi n, but there is also a, a, a partner to the wave function that is just staying close. You see they are close by because they live in two, really in two different spaces. Huh? Okay, so I do not really multiply them in the usual sense as multiplying two functions. Okay, they are just in two separate spaces. They account for both of them and in general, I can superimpose many possibilities, okay? So this is the most general form of a state that I can write in this combination of states. So until now, I was omitting altogether the spin, so I would write something like psi equal to sum over n, some coefficients times phi n. Okay, so this was our way of writing the most general state. Now, I have always to remember that the phi n can be accompanied by an up spin or a down spin, plus one half or minus one half. And in general, the coefficient in front can be different. Notice that the most general state is not necessarily a product. Okay, this is generally different from a product of an orbital state times a spin state, okay? Why is that? Okay, first of all, the most general spin state that I can write is a combination of these two. Let me call alpha plus the amplitude of the plus one-half state and alpha minus the amplitude of the minus spin, okay? So if I have a two-dimensional Hilbert space, I can always superimpose the two elements with two coefficients, all right? And if I want, suppose that these two states are normalized, hmm? if I want that this state is also normalized, then it's a simple matter to show that it's enough that you take the square modulus of the two to be just one, okay? So this would be the most general spin state made as superposition of these two objects. Now, you realize that uh, on, at the same time, the most general orbital state is this. Huh? But you see quite clearly that the, the state I have written here is in, gen in general not a factorized state. Okay? So the most general spin orbital state is not an orbital time a spin state but is in general something in which uh, orbit and spin are not factorized. This is very simple to, to, um, to see, okay? Um, I mean, you reduce from here to here only if this object is equal to Cn times alpha plus, and this object is equal to the same Cn times alpha minus, okay? Then you can factorize out this piece, huh? and you can factor out this piece, all right? So this occurs in certain cases, but not always. So let us discuss a little bit more since we know quite a bit about uh, Hilbert spaces of orbital wave function, let us discuss a little bit more the new guys. Hmm? What are they, really? You remember from our discussion of angular momentum that 
the possible values that an object um, that has commutation rules of this kind as are um, states in which j could be integer or half integer, okay? And j labels the eigenvalues of j square, j square being simply j, j plus 1. And there are, uh, generally speaking, two j plus 1 states belonging to the subspace, which would be distinguished by jz, which has eigenvalues from, called m, from minus j up to plus j. Okay? This is the, what we discuss for a general angular moment. Now, until now, we found clear evidences of the integer case, which was the orbital angular momentum, which we discussed, spherical harmonics and so on. However, we found no, so far, evidence of half integer. Now, this spin guy is the simplest and first appearance of an object which has the smallest half integer, one half, okay? In other words, if you take j equal to one half, you expect what? Two j plus one means two states, okay? Having m equal to minus one half and plus one half, okay? So these are exactly these two objects here. However, they live in a really different space. So you shouldn't think really of the electrons orbiting in any way. They are so-called intrinsic angular momentum that the electron has even without really turning around anything, okay? Kind of, uh, you can think of if the electron was uh, turning around itself, but it's, this is only a mental classical picture. I mean, it's really an intrinsic property that the electrons have, okay? All right, so these are two states, okay? And these are the two objects that I have written here, okay? So these two things are eigenvalues. Now, to, to, to just give a name, instead of calling it J generally, I will call it S, okay? So for me, this S square is now one half, one half plus one, which is three quarter value of a square, and uh, the spin uh, goes from minus one half z component, okay? So this is Sz. Sz goes from minus one half to plus one half. Obviously, everything here is in units of h bar, okay? Strictly speaking, there is an h bar square here and an h bar there, but to simplify the notation, I have rescaled everything by h bar, all right? So these two objects here, let me write them more carefully, are a state with plus one half z, which means a negative state. So let to write it more carefully. This is a negative state of Sz with eigenvalue plus one half. And then there is another partner, which is minus one half which means a negative state of Sz with the eigenvalue minus one half. Okay? Clear? Now, you remember that uh, together with Sz or Jz, I can f consider also Sx and Sy. Okay? And uh, in fact, you remember that I can form Sx plus i s y, let me call it s plus, and the emission conjugate, which would have a minus, okay? We uh, discuss, in, in general terms, what s plus and s minus should do, okay? They should increase or decrease the, 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 the number here, okay? So for instance, you can immediately conclude from the general theory that you would expect, let's see, S plus, 
of a state. Oh, in the notation I was using before, remember I had J and M. Okay? Now I am omitting this. So to have a more complete notation, I should write this as one half plus one half, and this as one half minus one half. But since I will never change the one half, okay, for L there is a meaning because L can be one, two, three, zero, whatever. But if we are discussing about spin one half electrons, one half is fixed in some sense. There is no point in carrying it uh, in all formulas. Okay, so I'm I am omitting really writing this. On the contrary, I am indicating okay that the quantization axis I have chosen is the standard Z. This is by no means forced. I mean, I could use as a quantization axis X or Y, for instance, or any other axis, and diagonalize simultaneously S square and SX or S square. Okay? More about this a little bit later. Okay, so let's see. S plus acting on plus one half. What does it give me? This is the topmost state. Okay, so the plus trying to increase it further should give me zero. On the contrary, S plus into the lowest thing should give me what? The plus one half with, remember the square root. The square root would be a uh, square root, if you remember, there is a j, j plus 1, minus m, m plus 1. Now, if m is, j, this is 3 quarter, because j is 1 half. And he, this is minus 1 half. So this is essentially 1 half times 1 minus 1 half, which is um, one, 1 half. So one quarter plus three quarter, one. Okay? So really, square root is one. Okay? Good. Better. Oh, I, I said that. I said that. Okay? I said that there is here, in principle, h bar, and here, in principle, where is it? Here, h bar square. Uh, but this would just complicate the formulas. We know that we are working with spin divided by h bar, so as, okay, everything has been risky. By the way, when I write here the Bohr magneton, I have already included the h bar in the Bohr magneton. You see? Okay? So I should always think of this to be without dimension. Otherwise, I count h bar too much. All right? So this L is already dimensionless. Okay, and in the same spirit, this S is dimensionless. Otherwise, H bar is already there, in other words. Okay, so is this clear? So the S plus, I know what it does in this small two-dimensional uh, space. Okay? And what about S minus? Well, S minus is also simple. Uh, you can prove that S minus of the plus one-half state is equal to the square root of 1 times the minus 1 half, while S minus of the uh, minus 1 half state is just equal to 0. Okay? So this thing follows from our general theory. Mm -hmm. If we assume that we have two states, as Dirac teaches us in some sense, so this is not something that I have derived for you. I have kind of given to you. There is an extra piece of Hilbert space, two-dimensional, and this must be then the action of the spin operators that we have derived in general. Okay, now let us uh, discuss a little bit more. You know that when once I fix a basis in a Hilbert space, I can always write operators as matrices. Suppose that I, I consider this Hilbert space. Any operator, hmm, say the Hamiltonian, whatever, I can associate to it the matrix element in the Hilbert space. Okay? So an operator becomes, in some sense, a matrix. Is 
this clear? And uh, states also become vector in some sense because I can associate the components of the vector on the basis. Okay, so this is kind of a vector. All right, and in fact, the action, for instance, of an Hamiltonian on a spin, mm, uh, which gives me a new vector, mm, I can pretty simply show that the vector associated to this is nothing but the product of the matrix H, N, N prime times the Psi, N prime. Okay? So once I choose a basis, vectors, operators, everything becomes either um, vectors or, sorry, states becomes vector, operators becomes matrices, and Operations like application of an operator to a, to, to a state become simply uh, multiplication of the corresponding matrices times the vector. Okay? Is this clear to everybody? Yes? Can I, can I assume it? Well, I mean, it's a very simple thing. So if you really are a bit dubious, just stop me and in one second I can show it to you. Okay? No, I see no. OK, good. So now I have a basis. Hmm? I decide to use this basis, eigenstate of SZ. And therefore, I can write any operator in the form of matrices. And by the way, I can write any spin state in the form of a vector. For instance, the state I had before, this spin state written as alpha plus plus one half plus alpha minus minus one half, okay? How do I write it as a vector? It's very simple. I have to take the scalar product with the basis elements, okay? So in the first component, I put the plus one half psi spin, and in the second component, I put the minus one half psi spin. Okay, this is the prediction of my, I mean, my just uh, uh, notation. Just putting the components of the different basis elements in a column vector. But now I immediately see, since this basis is, I mean, orthogonal vectors, orthonormal, this object is nothing but alpha plus, alpha minus, okay? So in some cases, I say a spin of components alpha plus, alpha minus, means this is the component of the first state, the plus, and this is the component of the minus, okay? So this is written as abstract vector, uh, abstract states, and this is as um, column vector. Is this clear? It's the same thing. I can play the game of going from one to the other. In the same spirit, these objects are uh, abstract operators acting on vectors. But I can always write them in the form of uh, matrices applied to vectors. Hmm? So, for instance, what is the matrix associated to S plus? and the matrix associated to S minus. This is something that I can ask myself. Okay, let's see. Are you following me? Is this clear? <clears throat> now, to calculate the matrix, for instance, what I should do is the following. I should calculate the component plus, let me omit the z, okay? For a while, I will always keep z fixed, okay? Later on, I will introduce also states of sx and sy, and therefore I need to specify. But for the time being, just let me omit this, okay? So this is s plus. Then I have the component plus one half minus one half minus one-half, plus one-half, and then I have minus one-half, 
minus one half. Okay? So this is the four elements that I am supposed to calculate according to the usual standard way of associating matrices to operators given a basis. Okay, so this is zero because S plus acting on this gives me zero. This is also zero hmm? because S plus gives me zero. This is just plus one half and this is just plus one half. You see? Therefore, when I take the scalar product with minus, then I get zero. So this is also zero. And here, when I take the scalar product, I get one. So the, this matrix is simply zero, one, zero, zero. Very simple. Hmm? If I do the minus, then I have minus, 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 minus. OK? So I should erase some of the things. OK? Now, for the minus, what happens is that uh, uh, here, the minus, 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 minus give me 0. So there is no, nothing here. So I should imagine here having 0, 0. The minus of a plus gives me a minus. And when I take the scalar product with the plus, I get the 0 again. The minus of a plus is a minus. And when I take the scalar product with the minus, I get the 1. It was a bit faster, but you understand that it was exactly the same calculation. So what about SZ, by the way? SZ is simpler, because here I should imagine having Z, Z, so something that is diagonal in the basis. Therefore, for instance, this object gives me plus 1 half, and this object gives me 0, 0, and this gives me minus 1 half. Okay, so the matrix associated to SZ is diagonal with the eigenvalues in the diagonal, as you expect, given the basis being basis of eigenstate of it. Okay? Now, I have constructed S plus and S minus, but the actual quantities we started from were SX and SY. But they are related, right? If you remember, S plus, S minus are just SX plus or minus I, S, Y. So you can invert this by, for instance, summing the two. You get S, X is equal to S plus plus S minus divided by 2. And by subtracting and divided by, dividing by uh, 2i, you get that S, Y is equal to S plus uh, minus S minus divided by 2i. Okay? Right? Yes. Okay. This for the operators, obviously. What about uh, for the matrices representing? Well, obviously the same thing. If you imagine that now I write the matrix of this will be equal to the matrix of this plus the matrix of that divided by 2. And similarly, the matrix of Sy will be the matrix of S plus minus the matrix of divided by 2i. Okay, so let us calculate the matrices. Okay. <clears throat> uh, from, from this two, huh, I get that the matrix of Sx, okay, is equal to the sum of this two huh, divided by a factor two. So I get one half, one half, but this time in the off diagonal here, rather than in the diagonal. And also notice there is no minus. And if I calculate the matrix of SY, OK, then I have uh, the difference of these two, OK? So something like 1 minus 1. But then I have to divide by 2i, so 1 over 2i minus 1 over 2i, OK? Now, let us do something. Let us take out all the 1 half. So this is 1 half times the, ma the matrix 1 minus 1. This is the matrix 1 half times 0, 1, 1, 0. And this is the matrix 1 half times minus i, i, 0, 0. 
uh, I've just taken i upstairs, okay? So I multiply by i everything and I get a minus i, and here I get plus i, and therefore I just write like that, okay? So notice this three um, matrices, this is called sigma x, this matrix is called sigma y, and this matrix is called sigma z are three two by two matrices. They have essentially the same properties as the spin one half. Notice they differ from the spin by just a one half and then h bar, obviously, that is, I mean, understood there. Hmm? Okay? For the rest, they are what? They are Hermitian matrices, for instance, this is obvious, I mean, the off-diagonal elements. You know that Hermitian matrices have properties that uh, the transpose is equal to the star. Mm. You recognize immediately an Hermitian matrix if you see one by the fact that in the diagonal you always have real values and the elements that are one transpose of the other are one the star of the other, okay? So, for instance, this matrix, you see immediately that there are zeros in the diagonal, so real values, and this is the star of that. And similarly, this, well, if it is real, it's, it means it is symmetric. So the emission is the generalization of the real symmetric matrices, okay? All right, so these are three emission two by two matrices, and indeed you realize that it is a basis of two by two emission matrices, okay? Uh, the other missing matrix is a, the obvious one, is the identity, mm. okay? Uh, if you count the number of elements that you need to form the most arbitrary two by two emission matrices, you realize that you need essentially four. Mm. These three have all zero traces, you see? Trace zero, zero, and zero. And the identity takes care of any trace in the possible thing. So these four matrices, identity plus the three so-called Pauli matrices, are also useful when you work with two by two emission matrices in general. And they are in particular spin matrices. Okay? Um, now, um, Let me erase a few things, because I need some space. Um, with the Stern and Kerlach apparatus, you can, make, you can make very nice experiments. In particular, so let me uh, just write here Sz equal to 1 half. 1 minus 1, okay? In particular, <coughs> you can do the following. <coughs> you can uh, block one of the spots, okay, by just filling the hole and leaving just a, a hole wherever there was atoms falling here, okay? In other words, your screen, you now make a hole there and no hole there. The screen remains full here. So the atoms ending up there just are blocked by the fact that there is no hole. When atoms going there come out, okay? So in this way, all the atoms coming out there have a well-defined component of mu z. Mu z, okay, in this picture here, remember, the Hamiltonian would have two mu b mm, for the magnetic field along uh, z, you would have s z b z. So the force now is clear. If I have a spin, even if there is no angular momentum, if there is a spin, 
and the spin is unpaired, like in, when you have a single electron, hmm, then depending if the spin is up or down, you will have a force. Because remember, the force uh, depends on the gradient, but depends on the projection of the spin. Okay? So a spin up ends up, for instance, here, uh, depending on the signs. I think uh, with the signs I have selected, the, the spin up receives a negative force. Okay? So all the spin ups, the plus one half, end up here, and all the spin downs, the minus one half, end up there. Okay? So the experiment is telling you that from the furnace, on average, exit half of the electrons in, say, spin up and half in spin down. Hmm? And so half go there and half go there. But if you now make a hole there and you just take only those coming from there, you know that 100% of the electrons there should have a definite spin minus one half z. Okay? In other words, this is like a measuring apparatus. You are measuring the spin. Okay? So immediately after, sorry, this is very, very ugly written. Let me write it more clearly. So the atoms impinging there would have plus one half z, but they are blocked. The atoms coming out of there would have minus one half z, and they are free to pass. Okay? So in this way, I can measure the spin, and I am pretty sure that after measuring it, the state is a pure spin, for instance, this. Okay? This is pretty much what we said. When you measure, you kind of collapse a wave function, and the wave function becomes a pure minus one half in this case. If you do the opposite, you make a, a beam of pure plus one half. Okay? Now you can ask repeated measurements, as you were worried about. Okay? So for instance, I can measure again. Uh, um, sigma z, uh, sz, which means put another apparatus exactly in the same z direction. Mm? Obviously, I know the answer. If the atoms are in the state minus one half, all of them, if I measure now with the second apparatus here, okay, so suppose that I have the beam now coming and I put another apparatus again in the z direction. Mm? I know that the deflection will be just in one direction only. So I will get 100% of the atoms ending up here and 0% ending down. Okay? This means a second measurement of SZ after having measured it gets with certainty the value minus one half. Okay? I measure it. I projected on it, I measure it again, I get 100% of the atoms there and zero there. And this is indeed the result of an experiment. Okay? So if you repeat the experiment with two apparatus exactly in the same direction, you get first half and half, but then you filter and you get 100% and zero. Okay? Now you can ask a more, uh, a less intuitive question. Suppose that I do this first experiment, and I filter the minus one half state, or vice versa, the plus one half, it doesn't really matter. Hmm? And then on this spin, I measure, for instance, Sx, which means I prepare now, rather than an apparatus in the z direction, an apparatus in the x direction, which means these two blocks are now turned, okay, like this, towards you, okay? This is y, this is z, and this is x. And now I let the beam go through this magnet, and I ask myself, where would this be deflected, here or there? In other words, would sx be positive or negative? Now, thinking classically, we we'll get the wrong answer. You say, wait, wait, the spin is minus one half. It's like this. So if I measure this, I get zero, right? There's no spin along x. It's all along z. And therefore, I expect just everything going straight. And here comes the surprising result. So if this is the measuring around z, you measure now along in, with the screen along x, and you get two spots like this. Again, 50% and 50%. 
This is very, very strange, right? You could think of it classically. So the spin is along minus, but if you measure along z, you get either this or that. Remember, when you measure an operator, you always get one of its eigenvalues, according to our theory. And after all, 0 is not an eigenvalue of Sx. You know that the possible eigenvalues of Sx must be plus 1 half and minus 1 half. Obviously associated to different states than this. Okay? These are eigenstates of Sz. The eigenstates of Sx are different. We'll construct them in a second. Okay? But nevertheless, the two possible eigenvalues must be plus and minus 1 half. After all, this is an arbitrary choice. I decide to diagonalize simultaneously S square and Sz, but I might have chosen S square and Sx, and I would obtain two eigenstates of S square and Sz, and obviously the eigenvalues of Sx must be plus or minus 1 half, not 0. So you do not expect quantum mechanically non-deflection. You expect, indeed, either one or the other. And surprising, you get half and half, which means that this state here, if you analyze in terms of eigenstates of x now, so the eigenstate of x in plus 1 half and the eigenstate along x of minus 1 half is really same amplitude. Huh? of the same, because I have half and half. So it means that the amplitude of this is essentially 1 over square root, and the amplitude of this is 1 over square root. Okay, So that the probability is 1 half and 1 half. Hmm? Now, I must be careful, however. Here, in principle, there are faces, Okay, here and here. The amplitude is uh, 1 over square root times a phase, because the probability doesn't care about the phase and is 1 half. OK? So in principle, I should be able to write the state along z as a superposition of the states along x with two coefficients that have a phase and a 1 over square root. And the same must be true for this. Okay? Same thing. All right? Shall we do that? So here again, there are 1 square root of 2 and 1 square root of 2 with faces. Let's see. OK, now, what are the eigenstates of Sx? Yeah. Why not? Fifty fifty. They are in the same space. Everything lives in this two dimensional Hebrew space. I'm not going out of there. Okay? For me, spins means these two vectors and they are possible superpositions in this way. Okay? This is the whole universe. It's the universe in a two dimensional Hebrew space. Okay? I'll show you that everything is perfectly compatible with this. Okay? How is it possible to Wait and see. This is not classical physics. Your brain thinks mostly in classical terms. Okay? <laughs> However, this is quantum mechanics, and it's true. That's the most yeah, interesting. Because you can measure things. So what I'm telling you now looks like dreams of a theorist, which are at the level of diagonalizing two by two matrices. But there is an experimentalist that can test them. Okay? And so these are tested things. So what I'm going to say comes from two by two diagonalizations, but they have been tested. Okay? So that's the beauty of this thing. This is not dreams. Okay? So this is the way reality behaves. Don't ask me why. This is okay. I'm not responsible for that. Okay. Now, uh, you are perhaps puzzled. I mean, I have this basis of plus one half and minus one half along z, and I tell you. Every state in the world can be made by superimposing these two things with arbitrary coefficients. Okay? So in other words, every uh, space in the world is just a vector, huh? alpha plus and alpha minus. 
let us find the vector uh, which are eigenstates of Sx. What should I do? I should solve the following problem. Sx is this matrix in that space. Uh, the arbitrary vector, I write it like that. Mm -hmm. And I want to find uh, eigenstates of this, so objects such that they do this. OK? Now, perhaps you're not surprised that I will find that lambda can be either plus 1 half or minus 1 half again. But the two states mm, are just mixture of uh, the basis element. OK? So perhaps you have seen this problem. OK? How do I find the eigenstate of a matrix like 0, 1, 1, 0? I'm sure you have done the 2 far away hydrogen atom or the tight binding. You have done tight binding with two sides? Yes. OK? So you remember that if I have a tight binding matrix that is 0 minus t minus t 0, I can form two states. One is the state 1 over square root of 2, the sum of the two, OK? So in this notation would be a vector 1, 1, OK? This object here has a, an energy minus 2t. Sorry, uh, this has plus or minus, um, let me see, this is plus or minus t, minus t. Mm -hmm. And so suppose that t was, was, was positive, this would be the ground state. And there is another state that is 1 over root 2, 1 minus 1, and this has energy plus t. Okay, so these are the two eigenstates of this 2 by 2 matrix. Now, here I have a very similar problem, except that I have no t and I have a plus 1. So you realize, and there is a 1 half in front. So you realize that there are two solutions. One is this, OK? And this is a solution with, um, with the eigenvalue lambda equal to plus 1 half. And this is a solution with eigenvalue lambda equal to minus 1 half. Let's verify. It's very, very, very simple. If I multiply this matrix by 1, 1, and I take a 1 over root 2, then you realize that what I get is 1, 1. So the same thing. OK? So I get the same vector, 1, 1. And obviously, with 1 over square root of 2 here in the normalization, and the 1 half that I had there. OK? If, on the contrary, I multiply by 1 minus 1, I get here a minus 1. And here a, um, and here a one, okay. And I can write this as this, this, and this, okay. So this is a, a negative state with eigenvector eigenvalue minus one. All right. In other words, eigenstates. What what does it mean? It means that the eigenstate of S X. I write it now in basis of eigenvalue plus one half. A long x is a superposition of 1 over root 2, the eigenstate plus 1 half along z, plus minus 1 half along z. OK? So x is really up plus down. Very, very strange. OK? This is classically very, very hard to understand. If you think of something being a magnetic moment along plus z and minus z, you never think of a sum of these two things giving you this. The sum of this, you think they give you 0. On the contrary, this gives you a state along x. Similarly, the eigenstate along minus 1 half is 1 over square root of 2, this thing minus this thing. Okay. This is just vector notation for this object. Sorry, the, the, the abstract uh, state notation for these two states. Is this clear to everybody? 
So I just proved to you that the two eigenstates of Sx are the following combination of the basis element of our Hilbert space, okay? Now, you can invert these two things, huh? and you find that, for instance, if you sum these two, hmm, you realize that uh, S plus Z is equal to 1 over root 2, this, plus, uh, plus 1 over root 2, the state along minus x. And similarly, if you subtract this, you realize that this is equal to, so is um, this minus that uh, uh, gives you uh, the minus. So um, this minus one over two. Okay. So here is the miracle of the one half and one half. Indeed, the state minus z is a superposition of a state plus x and the state minus x with amplitude 1 over root 2 and minus 1 over root 2. So when you take the probabilities, 1 half and 1 half. And if you measure, you will get 50%, 50%. All right? And if you measure the other, still 50%, 50%. Now, instead of measuring along z, you might Think of measuring along, um, now, along, uh, sorry, along x, along y. So you could do, repeat the same scheme, substituting y here. Mm -hmm. Now, you realize that the eigenstates of sy must have i's, you see, imaginary units. It's mandatory, okay? It's not my choice. If I select... Uh, these things to have certain faces uh, by necessity as y has the face. This comes, after all, from the commutation relationship. Remember that jx and jy commutator is ijz. There's no one there. There's an i. So i is intrinsic in quantum mechanics. There is no quantum mechanics without complex numbers, by the way. Okay? Now, if you do the same thing, you indeed understand that if you want you can write even this in terms of y, except that there are faces. And the correct way of writing it is, um, well, I have the opposite. I have the way of writing y in terms of z. And if you do it, you realize that you have here uh, i. Okay, and here you have minus i instead of minus. Okay, but again, the modulus square, this is just a phase. So the modulus square is one half and one half. So the probability of measuring uh, um, uh, y when you have a pure spin along z is still one half and one half. Okay? But now you see, related to the question that you asked before, what happens if I measure first z, then I measure x, for instance? If I measure x, I find 50% and 50%, I said. Okay? But I can block one and let one object pass. For instance, I can block the minus and I can have the plus one half passing. Okay? If I now measure sx again, I'm, I'm sure I will get 100% to the right. But if I measure, for instance, z again, then I will find again 50 and 50. Okay? So I have destroyed somehow this nice information because I have selected now a combination which somehow is a mixture of this and that. Okay? So when I remeasure it, uh, I will find again ambiguity, 50 and 50. Okay? So generally speaking, whenever the two operators do not commute, their eigenstates are different combinations. And when I measure repeatedly, I never find 100% zero repeatedly. I just start. So you see, measuring x and then measuring z, it's a bit like, again, having no information. Although, strictly speaking, it's not the same thing as here. We'll discuss this later on. 
when we talk about density matrices. We're kind of late, OK? So summary, there is a new object coming from the sky. The sky is called Dirac, OK? Uh, there is a new piece of Hilbert space, which we had so far forgotten. Mm? It's two-dimensional, so pretty innocent. Looks like very simple. Mm? Uh, you can make combination with arbitrary complex coefficients of these two objects, which are eigenstate of SZ. And with that, you can form a lot of states, in fact, an infinite number of states. Mm? Uh, infinite because, I mean, after all, these are two complex things, so arbitrary, just the square of this plus the square of that is one, so really a lot of states. Uh, with that, uh, we have constructed eigenstate of Sx, eigenstate of Sy, which are in general combinations, okay, of the eigenstate of Z, mm? and with that you can devise a series of Stern and Gerlach experiments which give surprising results in the sense that there are results that are deeply quantum mechanical, they violate our classical intuition about what a spin is doing. A spin along z, really when you start measuring it along x, it gives you again an answer, either that or that, mm? which is very surprising. It did, got, didn't give you zero. Mm? Now, next time we continue a little bit with this story, we will define spin along an arbitrary direction. After all, x, y, and z are just three possible choices, but you can define a direction n, arbitrary, given by a certain theta and a certain phi. We will construct the spin along this certain direction, and we will try to answer some questions. Some of them are pretty, uh, again, um, with a non-trivial answer. Um, some have a more uh, classical, understandable consequence. For, for instance, what happens if I measure now a spin with the Stern and Gerlach apparatus in a certain direction n? What is the probability of having one spot or the other? Okay? And what is the average value of the spin? Because by repeated measurement, I can form average values. We will see that the average value is very, very classically intuitive. But the result of every measurement is counterintuitive. Because again, as I show here, z can give you plus or minus, OK? But obviously, if I measure the average, I get 0, OK? So the average value of x that I get can be plus 1 half with 50% and minus 1 half with 50%, average 0. So the average is classically reasonable, but the individual measurement is not. Hmm? So we will discuss more this. We will discuss the Larmor precession of a spin in a field, and a few other things next time, okay?